Major funding for The Great American Quilt is provided by Keepsake Quilting, publishers of the Keepsake Quilting Catalog, the Quilter's Wish Book. By American School of Needlework Incorporated, publisher of books in all areas of needlework. By Lehman Publishing, publisher of Quilter's Newsletter Magazine, the magazine for quilt lovers. By Fairfield Processing Corporation, maker of polyfill brand products for crafting. By RJR Fashion Fabrics, where innovation is a tradition. And by New Home, changing the way America sews. Hi, we've got kind of a romantic show planned for you today, full of flowers and hearts and love, and even bowling shirts. We're going to start today, though, by talking kind of about romantic love, because we're dealing with bride's quilts, which are probably the most romantic type of quilt of all. What is a bride's quilt? Well, it's a quilt that a girl made before she was married, and it was meant to go on her marriage bed. So it was full of all her dreams of the future. And it was also really, in one way, a tangible kind of final exam in household skills. It was proof that a girl could sew well enough to keep a husband and children warm and clothed. You know, there was an old saying that if a girl hadn't made a quilt before she was 21, that she'd never be married. The reasoning behind this saying was that if a man could just as easily fall in love with a good sewer or a poor sewer, the smart man would check out the stitches per inch. Because a wife who could sew well was a real necessity before the invention of the sewing machine. Dora, after seeing your quilts, I find I must have you. Will you marry me? Girls started sewing for their future homes as soon as they could hold a needle. They would perhaps store as many as a dozen sheets and towels and pillowcases just waiting until they were married. Her quilt tops were saved unquilted until she got engaged. There wasn't a need to buy backing and filling and spend time on quilting if a girl wasn't going to start up housekeeping. Is this why so many unquilted tops have been passed down in families? Are these the quilt tops made by girls who were never married? Who knows? These are romantic mysteries that we'll never solve. Take, for example, this extraordinary quilt top. We can imagine all kinds of stories about a quilt design as full of romantic symbols as this one is. It shows birds guarding nests stuffed with eggs, ripe fruit and flowers in bloom, animals in pairs, and the clincher, red hearts. When this quilt top was discovered, the original patterns were found with it. Here's the double-handled vase. On the quilt top, it holds cherry branches. The owl turns up on oak branches, both alone and with a friend. Ostriches and a circus elephant named Hannibal add a touch of the exotic. It's these patterns that reveal a mystery about the quilt. Clearly, they show the figures of a woman and a man. Their hands are stretched out as if to touch one another. Can't we guess this couple represents the quilt maker and her husband-to-be, meant to be sewn together forever onto her bride's quilt? But when we look at the quilt, we find she's there with her hand outstretched, but he's nowhere to be found. What happened? Did she change her mind when it came time to sew him onto the block? Was it a broken engagement? Or did her love die in the Civil War, which was going on while this quilt top was made? We'll never know, and this mystery adds a bittersweet note to a quilt that's so playful that it shows what can only be described as men riding dogs. All we do know is that the woman thought to have made the quilt top never finished it. But in spite of that, it remains one of the most beautiful pieces of needlework ever made. The bride's quilt was traditionally the bride's 13th quilt top. The notice came out that the bride was getting engaged and neighbors came and friends came from miles around to kind of quilt and gossip and to help her get that work done that would get the quilts ready before she was married. 
The design of a bride's quilt was special. Let her other quilts use up fabric scraps. Her bride's quilt was meant for more than warmth. It visually expressed her romantic dreams. When I grow up, I think I shall have a beau, and his name is Sam B., and he lives across the street. For he sent me a valentine he painted himself, and it is a big red heart with an arrow stuck through it. And one of my school friends says that means he is very fond of me. But I don't see much sense in the arrow. A bride's quilt was a perfect excuse to use fashionable motifs and love symbols. Flowering trees, vines ripe with fruit, specially entwined bows and knots, and designs with two halves which fit together to make one whole. Motifs like this have been linked with love and fertility since the beginning of design. Up until about 1840, it was considered bad luck for anyone but a bride to use hearts on a quilt. Like all symbols, they maintain their significance, but not their exclusivity. Hearts still stand for love, but no one can be sure, unless the history of a quilt is known, that a heart on a quilt means it was certainly a bride's quilt. Diane and Laura are going to be showing you both hearts and bride's quilts. Their heart is a pattern that they'll show you how to make, and then I asked Laura to be sure and show you a wonderful quilt that friends made for her right before she was married. And the border? Oh, I just love Great. that border. Print. Today we're talking about hearts. And we're going to cover the paper basting method of making the heart. And then we have several quilts to share with you. These are bridal quilts that have used the hearts. Let's start with first showing you how to cut a paper heart. Fold your paper and then take long, swooping scissor bites and off we go down. And now we have our paper heart. If you'll take the shape that you've cut and trace it onto a piece of paper, you can get this four times onto a piece of paper and then you can simply make photocopies of it, make as many as you need for the quilt that you're making and then cut them apart and See how I folded it in half diagonally, and this will assure that the um, curves are symmetrical. Then place that paper heart onto the wrong side of the fabric that you're using for the heart. I have here just a little scrap of the fabric that I've used from my blouse, so it you can you. see that it really doesn't take much fabric at all. Then we're going to cut now allowance. So just cut around about a quarter of an inch. Now, most students want to cut clear out here, but no, stay just a quarter of an inch. This extension then will be used for turning it up. I will then baste up onto the edge of the paper and come down and make rather large basting stitches because these stitches here will be coming out later. You don't want to put too many in, but just enough to hold it down. Now, if you will just pinch that point, put your needle to the back side, fold it back over, secure it with another stitch, and then continue basting. But first, let me just turn this over so you can see what a nice sharp point that makes. Then we will continue basting all the way around, but notice on the curve that the stitches are smaller, they're closer to the edge, and then the V, I have spread the V out, again basted it down. Now we're ready for pressing. Let me give it a little press here, Diana. I'm going to press it firmly and real tight around this curved area. And can you see all that fullness that Diana was talking about when she basted it? This needs to come out, otherwise it will not lie flat when you have finished your heart. And see what I'm doing here? I'm just making little clips, cutting off all of those um, almost like little hills around the edge here, forming a V. And what this will do is eliminate the bulk. And at this point, I'm going to give it just one more good, firm press. And it's ready to go. We can put it now onto the background fabric. I have it here on the background fabric, but notice that I have folded a center line on my background fabric. Just do this with your fingers. Make it so that you can line up 
the V. Now I have my needle here and I want to show you the stitch that we use. It's called a back whip stitch. The thread is up into the fold line and I stick down in back of where I came up and out into the fold, down again into the point. Now notice these stitches are very small. They're about a sixteenth of an inch. Now I'm right to the very point and I go down and I come up. Make sure you make one stitch right on that point. Now if you can see here, there's some of that extension hanging out. I just take my needle, tuck it under, hold it and off I go. Now let me show you up here at the V. The heart has a curve, a V and a point. Those are three areas in applique that if you know how to do them and handle them, you can do anything. All right, now let me stick in and do one back whip stitch again so you can see that and I'm coming right down into the V. I'm going to turn this up and do a buttonhole stitch. Now notice that I'm coming through. Now you can see that my thread is not the same color as my heart. I would have the thread the same color as the heart. Now through the loop and there is the buttonhole stitch. I go to the back side and I will just continue until I'm all the way around. This secures this very, very good right there where it is weak. That looks great, Diana. Um, notice, too, that Diana used a contrasting fabric. However, if you were uh, making your hearts, you'd, of course, use a color to match your heart fabric. I'm now going to just quickly cut all of these little basting threads so that I can remove that paper pattern because I know you're thinking, how are we going to get that out of there? Turn the block to the back side, and if you will just carefully lift up the backing fabric so that you can make a cut without cutting into the paper or into the, the heart fabric, which of course you don't want to do, then you're going to trim all the way around the edge of this so that it will now look just like this. You can remove the backing fabric and... Oh, this is magic. The paper pattern comes out. And take a look. You can even use this again because it's still in good shape. So your heart is now ready to be incorporated into your quilt. Let's take a look. Some you of the can make hearts all sizes using the paper basting method. Small ones, very fat ones, skinny ones, whatever. This is our sampler quilt. Oh, Diana, look. This one was done. This was Katie Prindle's? Right. This is Katie Diana's is my daughter. daughter. <laughs> we want to show you some of the printed hearts here. And then maybe down, if you can show the quilting line. The quilting line, this is one of the reasons that we take out the paper. Um, She's echo quilted right. a little heart right in the middle of the applique heart. It just gives it a little bit more texture. That's the reason that we cut out the background. Now you could just as easily join these four hearts together into one 12 inch block, which would uh, just give another, another effect. Quilts for brides. A heart is, I don't know, they just both go together. They're, it's romance. They're special, that's right. <laughs> This one was made for Diana's daughter-in-law, Erin, Aaron. And, and Trisha, my daughter, gave the party. And each uh, heart was sent out, and uh, they put their, signed their names, and it was given as a, as a memento. Notice the bridesmaids' uh, fabric in the dresses here in the sashing. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this one here. This is the one that I made. and. What's nice about the heart is it's so simple, but you can embellish it with all kinds of little uh, embroidery stitches. I've added some of the uh, French knots here and signed my name and put a little bow right in the center. Some of the people, they signed their name with the You can use a pen. permanent marking pen, that's right. Here's another bride quilt. Uh, this, was, this was a great idea for a, a bridal shower because the, uh, was it the background fabric the background that was, fabric was sent, sent out. out? And then everyone could choose the fabric they liked to make the hearts. This is Laura's special bride quilt. <laughs> this is my treasure. Mm, this yes. one, this was made for me by all the ladies that I was working with at the time that 
that I was getting married and each one of them made one of the applique blocks as well as one of the, this is a, called trapunto blocks and um, they gave it to me as a gift at, at a bridal shower and then we set it all together and uh, designed a beautiful border for it and if you can see some of the different shapes that can be accomplished very accurately by using the paper basted method of applique. We know that you'll love this method. Don't you just want that quilt that Laura had? That was gorgeous. How about this one? This is a completely different theme. This is made out of bowling shirts. You know, some of us are lace types and some of us are more bowling shirt types. And this is by Petra Sausman. She found some old bowling shirts in an abandoned factory. She told me it was the King Louis factory in Cleveland, which sounds kind of fun. I can imagine her going through this empty factory and coming across this real treasure trove. She's cut up the bowling shirts and you can notice she's left some of the, po they're the pockets, they're where those names are embroidered. So it looks like she's got the whole gang here. This is, what does it say, Chip? And it's got the pocket right here with the, you know, kind of bowling king. This must be King Louis' motif, pretty sharp. You could use this little pocket to put love notes in your bed. That would be kind of fun. Sweeper, kind of cool names. There are some girls, but let's face it, most of these guys are guys on here. They, to have a whole quilt full of guys bowlers names. And in the center, it was fun. Well, I think this is kind of a fun quilt. She's kind of a fun person, and we're going to be seeing another quilt by her later on in the program. This was an early quilt by her. Kind of funky, but the other quilt is equally strange. I she does strange quilts and I love them, but look for it later in the program. And this is not strange, this is just outright gorgeous. This is by Eva Matsai, who is from originally Czechoslovakia, and she's showing us here her love of Czechoslovakian culture. This has 300 leaves that are standing for 300 families in this club in Colorado. She's from Inglewood. And I'm going to pull up this gorgeous heart here because we're talking about heart quilts today. And Rod promised me that he found us a gorgeous heart quilt to show us. And we'll just see what he came up with. Well, did you find the heart quilt? Well, the one that I thought was going to work for us didn't. It had to go to a, a quilt guild show. So I didn't get it. Well, we were lucky to get this one this morning. This well, is by uh, this is friend Giddy Harms. Yeah, this isn't this beautiful. lovely? I've got a question I wanted to ask you right away okay. because I thought this was maybe a four block Ohio, but obviously it has many more than four blocks. When I see this orange, I think of Pennsylvania. It's a nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't necessarily. You, you really, it, it can't pinpoint it regionally. Okay. The color combination, the orange, green, and red, is a good clue for the 1850s, 1860s, oh. to as late as around 1875. Okay. Um, but any other location, I mean, I've seen a lot of red, green, and orange quilts from Ohio. Um, I've seen them from Pennsylvania. I've seen one in the South. Uh-huh. So... So it's just color fast fabric that people like to well, use? Well, the, the orange, you can see here, actually in this area, there's a little bit, it, it's been over dyed. Mm -hmm. The green has been too. Green was a very unstable fabric, a very unstable color. And this is over dyed yellow blue to mm -hmm. create the green. And you can see it as you just look at, at different parts of it. What's the, do you have a name for this applique block? I call it currants and coxcomb. It's loosely based on that. I mean, and most applique patterns were varied by the maker themselves. So they'd name it. it right. Could be I mean, this looks very much like a poinsettia uh -huh. flower. But I mean, this is like the quilt we looked at last week. That's right. We've been talking about love today, and I want to talk about taking care of quilts. I've got a couple of quilts that I really love because they were done by my grandmother. And in a way, I want you to learn from some mistakes that we made. One of these quilts is in really good shape, and the other one isn't. Take a look at what has happened to this one. You can see the, just the difference in color here. 
this side wasn't near the light, but this side was on a twin bed. This is a twin quilt that my grandmother made. And you can see how faded this is. And I really just noticed this. If you look over here, can you see how this fabric is worn? I don't think it's because this area got any more wear than the other area. It's really because of the sun just having its effect not only on the color of the quilt, but it just wears it down. It makes it a little more fragile. So I know a lot of you have family quilts out there, and I hear the same questions that you're asking over and over. You want to know how you can prevent damage, and you also want to know just how to take care day to day of those quilts. So one of the things that you've got to think about if it's on a bed, take a look and see if the sun is coming in. If it is, just pull the shades in that room when the sun is going to be in that area because as you can see, it really can make a difference in the color. Storing the quilt is also important, and I've got this. I love this quilt. It's kind of an art deco look. I didn't even know my grandmother was a quilt maker until she gave me this quilt, and I was kind of surprised. So I try to take really good care of it because I think it's got a beautiful design. What I've got in here is an old sheet of my daughter's to pad those folds. If you can, and you've got room, you can always have a quilt just lying flat on a bed. That's the best thing to do. But if you don't have room, and I don't, I've got to have it in the closet, pad those folds because then there's a very gentle curve, and you can do all the folds. That will keep you from having those permanent creases. What happens when you fold a quilt is if it stays for a long, long time, that area that is um, folded the material gets stretched right where it's folded, and those cr uh, creases will just stay in there. So put an old sheet, something like this, to just pad the folds. Refold it every oh, three months, every four months. I know it's just one of those extra things that you have to do, but it is good for your quilt. And then you can put it in a pillowcase, an old sheet. That's really the best way to store it. I know the way that a lot of you store them is in plastic bags. A plastic bag is good for sending a quilt just in case the box gets wet, but it's not a good way to store it because it will keep moisture not only out but in. And store quilts kind of in the same kind of temperate conditions that everything else in your house is in. Not in the basement if it's really, really cold or out in the garage or in the hot attic. They like to just be in the same kind of temperature that you would be. I'm trying to think of the most oh, common question that people ask, and I think it's really about spots. And unfortunately, I wish I had a magic answer to give you, because when you unfold old quilts, there are often spots. Even this one that I love very much has spots. And I don't know how they get on there. They can get on there from anything that you ever have on your hands, even hand lotion. When you touch it, 20 years later, a spot can appear. As I say, I wish I could tell you exactly how to get rid of them. Basically, you just have to love the quilt as it is. If you want to wash it, make sure that you're using detergent that is made very much for cleaning fine fabrics. Don't agitate it a great deal. If you think it is a masterpiece quilt, don't wash it at all. If it's a real treasured family heirloom, either leave it alone and love it for what it is, or take it to a restorer. You can find that in the library. They would have a list of good restorers in the area. If it's a quilt that's seen better days and you just love it and you want it to be clean, wash it very, very gently and just take a lot of care. Now that we've talked about loving quilts and we're talking about hearts and flowers, uh, I'm going to show you this because it's just beautiful to me. We're going to take a look out in the garden and we're going to look at some more flowers with some artists that have made flower quilts. Jane Sassman, an artist from Chicago, has done two quilts with really very different moods. One, a daytime garden where fronds uncurl and leaves push up, attracted by the warmth of the sun. The other, a cool, rather mysterious garden seen by the light of moonbeams and fireflies. Petra Sosman from Kansas City, who made the bowling shirt hearts we looked at earlier today, here shows us another night garden view. 
This a strange place, full of spiky tendrils that seem to search through the darkness for enough moonlight to grow by. In a different mood entirely, Setsuko Sagawa, the well-known Japanese quilt maker who now lives in Rhea, California, arranges flowering wisteria branches and antique fans against a patchwork background for a peaceful springtime garden. Jean Hughes from Fort Worth, Texas, mixes flower colors with flower shapes in this quilt that gives the feeling of growing things without being a literal picture of a garden. An even more abstracted garden grows in this quilt by Joy Seville of Princeton, New Jersey. Joy gives us just the impression of a garden here by using colors and leaf and petal shapes. Wasn't Joy's quilt gorgeous? It has kind of a Monet's water lily type of feeling. Next week, we're going to go from the garden kind of into the country. I'm thinking of it as kind of a picnic in the gallery. And Laura and Diana will be showing you how to do bear's paw. So please be with us.